Today's topic is Meiji Modern, what women's education means then and now. And as you can see, this concept of Meiji Modern is really the key term and key theme uh, for us today. And this theme was inspired by the exhibit uh, that will be happening at the Asia Society Museum in New York uh, in the fall this year. And it is called Meiji Modern. Uh, and picking up from that, uh, we started to think about what really modernism means, uh, and also to discover that education, and in particular women's education, actually is a key theme in modernization. So that's how this theme came about. Um, I'm very happy to have very distinguished panelists with me today. Uh, their illustrious career uh, is in your program, but let me just quickly mention that Dr. Junko Hibia is a distinguished sociolinguist. Uh, she's a professor emerita of the International Christian University and a pioneer liberal arts educator uh, in Japan. Uh, and she was the first female president of ICU uh, from 2012 to 2020. 2020 to 2020. Um, oh, I also have online with us from New York, Dr. Shunichi Nick Homa, uh, who is a distinguished cardiologist. Uh, he is the Margaret Milken Hatch Professor of Medicine at Columbia University, uh, and uh, where he serves as the Chief Medical Officer of Faculty Medical Center. Uh, and also, he's the Deputy Chief of Cardiology Division. But today, he's actually uh, joining us as the founding member and chair of the Digital Museum of the History of Japanese in New York. So uh, we have three topics today. Um, first, I will briefly introduce you to women's education in the Meiji period. Uh, and then Nick, Nick Homa, he'll be talking about the Iwakura mission, which happened during, at the beginning of the Meiji period, and women's education, and what women's education means today. So, um, for those of you who know your Japanese history, uh, the Meiji period started from 1868 to 1912. And uh, it really was the end of the shogunate and the feudal system. Uh, and women's education became a very big, important topic uh, for the Meiji government. And women's education was really the national strategy for this new government of Japan for two reasons. One, to educate women to become educators themselves of children, so shōkokumin. So the country really looked to women to educate the next generation citizens. Uh, the second reason is, of course, to modernize Japan. Um, Professor Carol Gluck uh, at one of the conferences mentioned that uh, at one point, civilization was measured by the level of, uh, or the status of women in society. So modernization and civilization, to a certain extent, is measured by how women are treated uh, in society. And of course, at this time, modernization meant, at least for the Japanese government back then, Europe and the US. And against this backdrop, uh, there were girls' schools uh, established, and the first national girls' school was established in 1872. Uh, so as you can see, the Meiji period started in 1868, and the first national girls' school was established in 1872, which really tried to address higher education for girls. Uh, and by the way, this uh, national girls' school eventually became Ochanomizu. Today, um, you may also know that uh, the what's called the Seven Sisters Colleges of the U.S. and those are Mount Holyoke, Wellesley, where Dr. Gluck is a graduate, uh, Smith College, which is my alma mater, uh, Bryn Mawr, which is Tsuda Umeko's uh, Bryn, uh, alma mater, Vassar, Radcliffe, and Barnard. All of these uh, sister schools were established during the Meiji period as well. And against this backdrop. So to think about modernization, think about education, uh, think about women's education, 
there was an Iwakura mission sent, and there were five girls included uh, in this mission. Uh, and so I'd like to now turn to Dr. Homa, uh, who can talk about the Iwakura mission, uh, which started in December of 1871. So three years after the beginning of the Meiji period. So over to you, Nick. Okay, thank you, Claire. This period is really an interesting period and how these girls wound up in the United States and what happened to Japan when they went back is a fascinating story that we can learn so much from. Let me start here. Okay, so, um, First, a short introduction to the museum. This is a web page from the museum, so please visit when you can. We open summer of 2021, and we have about 150 items. Next slide. Well, how did this museum begin? As many of you know, Asakawa Kaiichi is a well-known figure in promoting U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, he is the first Japanese professor at Yale and a graduate of Dartmouth College in 1900, where I also graduated from. And when my wife and I visited his grave in New Haven, we noticed there were other graves of Japanese who died at young age. You can see there are two uh, smaller graves uh, on the right side of the slide. It then occurred to us that there are many aspects of history of Japanese in New York and nearby areas that are just not known, forgotten, or documented. Later in 2020, in midst of dark days of COVID, I had a dinner with Ambassador Yamanouchi, and we spoke about how we could cheer up Japanese people in New York area, including us, of course. There we agreed that we should document how Japanese in the past have become pioneers, lived through difficulties, and become inspirations for us to follow. We then formulated a board with business and academic leaders, with support from the consulate, and board members include historians uh, such as Professor Gluck, who unfortunately could not join us today, uh, who is recovering from a temporary illness, as well as those who have lived through challenges to succeed in New York, such as a uh, jazz pianist, Toshiko Akiyoshi. Uh, next slide, please. And in addition to the items we have, we organized special exhibitions. And last year, it was about Iwakura mission in the US. And this is to collaboration with the Asia Society and today's seminar. Also related, we have an exhibition on role of Quakers in women's education in Japan. So please visit. Uh, now, uh, let's go to today's topic, Iwakura mission and women's education. This is a quick summary of Iwakura mission. So as Clay already mentioned, they left Japan December of 1871 and came back September of 1873. So it was almost two years. The purpose was to gain recognition for a new government under the new emperor, which started in 1868 begin negotiation of the unequal treaties from Edo period, and also study industrial, political, military, and education systems. They actually visited 17 countries and municipalities, which included the US, France, Belgium, and others. And the time they spent in the US was January of 1872 to August of 1872. So it's about seven months. They left in December and got to uh, New York and Washington area in January. Members included well-known politicians that we read in history books, such as Iwakura, Okubo, Kido, Ito, and Kume. And there were 48 mission members and about 53 students. And there were five girls included here, which is a major topic for today. So why? Why were girls included? Kuroda and Mori are the ones who pushed for inclusion of girls, but why? In 1869, Hokkaido became an official part of the Japanese empire, and Kuroda was put in charge of its development. And he thought well-educated women need to support family and to support the country. 
So basically, he thought women need to be educated to support the family, children, and the country. It wasn't about educating women for women's sake, but educating them for the country's sake. And at this time, there are already a large number of male students in the U.S. In fact, there are over 200 students at this point. So five girls wasn't that much of a number. And for the information, uh, in Germany, there were about 70 about this time. How were they selected? It was by solicitation. It wasn't a bad deal, actually, if you read this. All expenses paid, excellent stipend. They got about $800 a year. And at that time, average salary of a, um, say, a technical person, like a mach machinist, plumber, was about $600. But it required 10 year commitment. And notice it's different from men who spent a couple of years and went back. And you couldn't return to Japan for 10 years. Of course, there were no parents, relatives, no Japanese school, of course, no Japanese restaurants, and no jobs were promised to the girls when they returned. And of course, they got no volunteers. And eventually, pushed by the parents, only five volunteers became available by October of 1871. Remember, they left in December, so it was really the last minute volunteers who were able to fill the uh, positions. So what are common about these volunteers, or rather volunteers by the family, shall I say? And the family all were on Tokugawa side of Oshin War. So they were on the losing side of the fight between the shogun and the emperor. And father or brother of each one of these family uh, has had experience in Edo period involving US or Europe in terms of diplomatic or other scholarly relationships. So they came from a family that knew what's outside of Japan and they were on the losing side of the battle. And why wasn't this repeated? After 1871, there were many Japanese men who went to study abroad after 1871, but no more girls. Well, it was obvious to the government that they couldn't get any volunteers. This program didn't really work. So this was the first and the last time girls were sent. So who are they? What other volunteers? And here is a photo taken before departure to the U.S. Yamakawa Stematsu, Ueda Teiko, Suda Ume, Mrs. Long, who was wife of ambassador to Japan, and she chaperoned the girls to arrive in the U.S. Yoshima Suryoko and Nagai Shigeko. And these are the ages in parentheses. And of note, Ueda Teiko and Yoshima Suryoko returned to Japan in 1872. So only Stematsu, Ume, and Shigeko remained in the U.S. So let me talk about these three girls. So, Oyama Stematsu, as many of you know, her name used to be Sakiko. And her name was changed to Stematsu by her mother when it was decided that she goes to the United States. Stematsu, ste means to discard, throw out. Matsu means to wait. So it means I'm throwing you out of the country in a way, but I'll be waiting for you. Now, after arrival in Japan, in, in the US, she lived with Bacon family, uh, who was a minister in New Haven, who went to Hero House High School, which is a very progressive school in New Haven, and entered Vasa College in Poughkeepsie. Returned to Japan 1882 after 11 years in the U.S. and married Oyama Iwaro. And you can see the picture on the left bottom. Little yellow arrow points to a stematsu whose maiden name was Yamakawa. And in the middle, you can see stematsu with Nagai Shige, 
who also went to Russia Music School, actually, not the collegiate program, but the music program, and with her American friend. And to the, on the right hand top, you see statue of Oyama Iwao, which is still at Kudanzaka Park in Tokyo. And you can see a picture of um, Fematsu as the aristocrat after marrying Oyama Iwao. So this is Uryu Shigeko. Uh, she lived with Abbott family in New Haven, which uh, was also a religious family went to Abbott School, which is operated by the family, and went to Basra Music School. Returned to Japan in 1881, and married Uryu Sotokichi, whom you can see uh, left on the left side of the bottom, who was actually at Annapolis, at a naval, which is a naval officer's school. So actually, Shigeko and Uryu knew each other in the United States before they got married after they went back. And then Wuryu, because of his accomplishment in Sino-Japanese war, was made a baron. So uh, Shigeko became a baroness. And then on the right hand top is Shigeko at the later years. So this is Suda Omeko. She lived with Raman family in Washington. DC and the Raman worked for Mori Arinori in the Japanese uh, embassy. She graduated from Georgetown Collegiate School in the Archer Institute, which is a progressive school in Washington, DC, returned to Japan in 1882, and then came back to attend Green Moor in 1889. She never married, and she eventually found Joshi Ega Kujuku in 1900, which is a predecessor of Suda University and greatly aided by Stemats and Paris Bacon. And remember, Bacon is a family with whom Stemats stayed with, and Alice was her basically American sister. So, what are their common experiences? All three girls lived with progressive thinking family, went to progressive schools, grounded in Christian thinking. And was mentioned by Pear, this was time of women's educational institution development. Seven sister schools were developed all during this time. Mount Holyoke in 1937, Versailles 61, Wellesley 70, Smith 75, and so forth. And remember, Sudo Meko went to Brimoa in 1889. So it was a new school at that point. Same thing with Vassa, which was only established in 1861. And this photo was taken during 1876 World Exhibition in Philadelphia. You can see Umeko, Stematsu, and Shigeko. So they were close friends in the US. Next slide. So what were their problems after returning to Japan? Well, they spent more than 50% of their life in the US. In Umeko's case, it was more than that. At that point, Japanese view on women's role was they should be good mother, support family, husband, and through that the country not independent thinkers or having a career path. Another problem was that these girls couldn't speak Japanese well or write well. Remember, there were no Japanese school as is now. So with these two factors, they couldn't find satisfying jobs. And Janice Nimura, who wrote Daughters of the Samurai, which chronics, chronicles stories of these girls, wrote, they were home and yet at some deep level, they would never cease to be homesick. In a way, they were extreme kikokushijo. What happened to them? Well, the singular focus remained women's education. Suda Umeko, aided by Oyama Stemas and Alice Bacon, who was 
American sister, should I say, of Stemats, actually came back to Japan and helped establish Joshi Gakujuku, which became Tsuda University. And Tsuda Gomeko's thinking about women's ed education is quite different. And she wrote in 1893 in an English newspaper in Tokyo area called Japan Weekly Mail, we want a clear head and clever tongue to show the men how much is unjust in the rights of women. We want better teachers for the schools and leaders in good movements pertaining to women. So that's what she had in mind when she opened the school. The problems now, pathway to equal education has been largely consolidated, but after education, working environment remains difficult. Understanding of why women are needed in working places is very much necessary. Change in thinking of existing leaders and more new leaders with understanding to be in position of responsibility. And next point, the last slide. Next slide, please. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Akiko Kuno, uh, who wrote Rokumeikan no Kifujin, which is a wonderful book published some time ago, as well as Janice Nimura, who wrote Daughters of the Samurai. Very important information in these books. And this is uh, uh, from June of 2023, when myself and Lane Walker from the concert uh, had a very nice dinner uh, with them together. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. So um, let me actually come back to my part. And since Nick actually mentioned um, uh, Kuno Akiko-san, I'd like to also mention that uh, there is this uh, foundation, scholarship foundation called the Group Bancroft uh, Scholarship Foundation, which is for Japanese high school students who are interested in going to the US to attend a liberal arts college. Uh, and underneath the Group Bancroft Foundation, uh, Akiko-san as a leader actually set up a sub-foundation. Uh, it's, it's the Stematsu Scholarship uh, for Japanese girls who want to go to a women's college in the United States. So, um, you know, that history continues. Uh, and by the way, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, Akiko-san is, uh, Kuno Akiko-san is the great granddaughter of Stematsu. So uh, that runs in the family. And uh, we're very grateful that uh, there are these pioneers who continue to be committed to women's education here in Japan. But uh, let me actually now turn to Professor Gluck, Carol Gluck. Uh, she's talked extensively about uh, women's education. And if we can have that slide up. Um, so she's always questioned uh, what role uh, women's education plays over time. And I think the slide is coming up. But uh, uh, she, and although, um, you know, Nick mentioned that uh, at uh, these Japanese uh, women's colleges and, and still within Japan, uh, girls and women were educated to be good mothers and wives. That wasn't only the case in Japan. I think it was a very similar situation in the United States too. So while there were these Seven Sisters Colleges, um, I think in the 1800s, they were seen more as finishing schools. And there was very much a, a focus on uh, women being educated to be good mothers and good wives. Uh, so, you know, the, the focus and the purpose of women's education changed over time, but nonetheless, and it wasn't immediate, and it was gradual, and nonetheless, women's education played great um, roles in many respects, according to Professor Gluck. Uh, first of all, uh, women's rights in the workplace. So of course, you know, women became workers, laborers, and from their health perspective, there were a lot of movements to protect women's bodies. And eventually that led to uh, women's rights. Mothers should be protected at work kind of concept. Uh, of course, there was the suffrage movement. Uh, and although uh, in Japan, women's right to vote did not come until after World War II in 1947, uh, according to Professor Gluck, it was really because of all of the movements that took place before that 
by women that eventually led to the suffrage movement and the women's right to vote in 1947. Um, and also uh, this concept that uh, women are, can be empowered as individuals, women as individuals, uh, which of course led to empowerment of women. Uh, she believes that uh, um, also it's very important to, for society, that these women became um, consumers in moving the society forward. But most importantly, the world is changed really by each and every woman. Uh, her theme is from is to ought to be, which is that you, know, you can change the status quo. Uh, you shouldn't just sit idle uh, by looking at the way things are, but really thinking about uh, what the society needs to be, what women should be, what the role of women should be uh, in society. And that is the ought to be concept. Having said that, the landscape really, I mean, the landscape has changed in certain respects, but not so much in other respects. Um, and this is the gender gap index that was published recently. Uh, it was a uh, shocking news, I think, for many in Japan, that Japan ranks at 125th out of 146 countries. But if you look to the US, the U.S. is not, I mean, of course, it's much better than 125, but the U.S. is also at 43rd. Uh, what is very similar between the U.S. and Japan is that while in terms of education and health, uh, in both countries, women rank very, very high, it's really in the political space, in the, the economy, meaning business, uh, where we're lacking leadership of women. Um, and while um, because of great educators like Tsuda Umeko and others, you know, we have been able to advance education uh, in Japan, but there's so much more to do uh, in terms of closing the gender gap. So now I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Hibia uh, to pick up from that the gender gap issue. So Hibia says. Thank you, Ms. Claire. I would like to start uh, from Dr. Homa's uh, presentation in which uh, he mentioned Oyama, Uryu, and Tsuda had many problems after they returned to Japan. My point today is their problems are still with us. Their problems are our problems. As you have just seen, the agenda gap rankings this year dropped further down to 225th. Um, Ms. Chino uh, just has showed us a nice visual representation, so I would not uh, repeat the details, but I just would like to draw your attention uh, to their uh, sentence appeared on page six. Within East Asia and the Pacific, Fiji, Myanmar, and Japan, emphasis mine, are at the bottom of the list. This is really a shameful statement. And on page, uh, it's uh, hidden, but 30, I remember correctly, in focus country performance, Japan's parity in political empowerment at 5.7% is one of the lowest in the world. Here, as you saw, uh, it says that uh, there is almost full parity on both the educational attainment and health and survival sub-indexes. I do have an issue with uh, the statement that uh, the full parity has almost been uh, accomplished in the educational attainment. And I would like to uh, show you some data uh, to support my uh, statement. This is the uh, university, four-year university entrance rate uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, the data are uh, based on a basic school survey, that's Gakko Kihon Chosa in Japanese, uh, which is taken every year on May 1st. This particular graph uh, was made from the data uh, from last year. As you see, the discrepancy between male students and female students entering university, for your university has been narrowed. Yes, that's true. However, if you look at the female student ratio by field, you see a serious problem here. 
there are so many female students uh, beyond 60% in humanities, pharmacy, nursing, and other. Other includes home economics, uh, fine arts, and music. That's why. Uh, social sciences uh, is below 40%. Agriculture, a little bit uh, more than 40%. And if you look at uh, med medicine, is also about uh, 40%. Education is about 50%. But if you look at science and engineering, particularly engineering, the figure is really low. And we do have to tackle this problem. While I was preparing for this uh, presentation, the quick estimate from the Ministry of Education came out last week. The, uh, the discrepancy between male and female students uh, narrowed down even more at 47.5%, uh, if I remember correctly, at the undergraduate level. But you see the uh, constant downward trend going uh, from undergraduate to uh, master's level graduate, uh, PhD level graduate, and then faculty. Right now, about 27% of faculty members in Japanese universities are female. This should be 50%. And since this is the quick estimation, I don't have the details among faculty members. But uh, from assistant to associate to full professor, vice president, and president, as you go up the ladder, the less number you get, which is a serious problem. I do not have uh, fancy pictures from the Meiji period like Dr. Homa. So this is uh, the two pictures <laughs> which I am going to show you, which is, of course, today's picture. Uh, this is a view from my office no longer my office, uh, the president's office of International Christian University. It was taken in, uh, I think, October. Uh, so you see some colors in the uh, leaves. It's, it's a beautiful campus. Uh, and uh, from there, since uh, that was mentioned in my bio, I was the first female president of the university. At that time, there were about 10% of female presidents in Japan. And I began to think a lot about, you know, how uh, female presidents can be uh, more in this country. So let's uh, take a look at the latest data. Now, uh, this is from last year. There are 782 universities in Japan, out of which 109 are led by women, 13.9%, almost 14%. Here again, the breakdown is important. If you look at national universities, only four out of 85 are led by women, less than 5%. If you look, uh, look at private universities like ICU, uh, the number is 14.2%. In the middle, uh, I show you uh, the uh, percentage of uh, for public universities. That's Kenritsu Daigaku or Shiritsu Daigaku. There, the number is a little bit beyond 20%, and you might say, oh, this is a nice figure. However, you have to be very careful. There are 99 public universities today, and I checked uh, the, the website of the Association of Public Universities. Quite a few of them are specialized in nursing, nutritional sciences, welfare, etc. Et so like so-and-so shiritsu or so-and-so kenritsu kango daigaku or so-and-so eiyo daigaku, so-and-so fukushi daigaku, and so on and so forth. So the uh, gap <coughs> between among the uh, field of specialties uh, that I showed you earlier today still uh, Emphasize, I'm sorry, influences the percentage of female university president at the university level. Since you have quite a few students, quite a few undergraduate, graduate students in some fields, you have uh, about 20% uh, presidents in uh, these universities specializing in those fields, but that's not the case in other general, bigger, or liberal arts universities. So uh, from um, my uh, data, I would like to raise a few points for discussion. 
Number one is how can we encourage female students? We have to start from elementary school. It's too late to encourage high school seniors to, why don't you go to science field? That's like absolutely too late. So we have to start from elementary, middle, and high school students to become interested in more diverse fields of study. I have nothing against measuring humanities. I did myself. However, we really have to diversify their interests. Next, uh, how can we achieve a balance between work and personal life? Because unless uh, that's established, I don't think we can get many female graduates into our fields, and then I encourage them to become leaders of their uh, respective field. And finally, how can we develop aspiring leaders? Tsuda Umeko is absolutely an aspiring leader of this country. So how can we produce more Tsuda Umeko in the future? And with that, I would like to close my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Ria Sensei. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions? And one is that uh, you mentioned that um, you know, uh, if you look at the female student ratio by field, it's quite a skewed. And I would assume that uh, it's because of the historical context in that women's education tended to focus more on women becoming good mothers, good wives, so home economics, you know, things to do with nurture. And I presume that that historical context is still ongoing, which is the figure that we see today. But is, is my assumption correct? Yes. And I would like to particularly stress that unconscious bias is so strong. There are some high school teachers discourage female students go into uh, like the field of engineering or science. Some parents do too. And we have to remedy the situation, yes. But from my point of view, the unconscious bias is so strong when these girls were attending kindergarten. So that should be corrected. Also, you mentioned that uh, students need to be encouraged. But at uh, the young age, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, it's not really necessary those children's mindset to go into science or other things. So um, of course, it's the mothers, it's the fathers, uh, it's an all-team effort to do that. But what is the role of educators in that context? Or you know, is it the curriculum? Well, what, what is it from yes. the educational perspective? Curriculum, yes. Uh, we have to really change the mindset of parents. So those who are born to progress parents, they are very fortunate. But some are not so progressive. So the educators, particularly elementary school teachers, should really be trained to undo that bias from day one. And as you know, so many elementary school teachers are female, so they have their own experience. So I would like to really encourage them to look back on their past, what was wrong and change that um, whatever was wrong with their education from day one. Because it really is important to start incrementally from the very beginning. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. And, and Nick, before I go to you, I know that you have a lot of comments too. But if I can just ask you another question as a linguist. Um, so I was in the UK until the age of four. I came to Japan at the age of four. One of the things that really shocked me was the, the words and um, I guess the notions expressed by words to describe boys or girls. Boys shouldn't cry. Uh, and even cartoons would have you know, things like that. This and that. Um, is Japanese, the Japanese language, more so in shaping gender role in your view as a linguist? Unfortunately, I have to say yes. So uh, you really have to be careful what you say. And even before I became president, uh, when I was at ICU, um, I really became conscious of like every single word I say. And being me, I was kind of shocked to find out that even I sometimes say a few things 
not as bad as what <laughs> Ms. Chino has just um, introduced, but some words or some expressions which are not really the ideal. So everybody has to be much, much conscious about that. And there were so many uh, articles, books in linguistics written about that. So uh, go to a bookstore, to the library, and you know, read some of those uh, writings. Thank you. Nick, can I turn to you in New York? Uh, some of the thoughts on uh, what uh, Hibia Sensei mentioned, and also maybe you being in the medical and, the, and science field. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, what education can do to maybe have more female, female doctors? And not only have more female doctors, but one of the issues here in Japan is that uh, a lot of the female doctors are um, stopping becoming doctors at hospitals because of the really tough work environment, long hours. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, medical students in the US is actually even higher for women than the men in schools. So they get educated. The problem is the working environment flexibility in work hours, what they do when they become pregnant, when they come back, what is the evaluation process. And th those are the major issues, at least in medical field. And especially for flexible working hours, uh, we are trying to, for example, change the hours women doctors can work, uh, work several hours a day, and have different groups of people to actually formulate a uh, group practice mentality, shall I say, so that everything is covered. But flexibility is so much necessary. And we don't always do that. And I think, for example, in, um, in, in Japanese companies, uh, that's one of the things that one obviously uh, can do a better job at. And uh, uh, in, in terms of, say, parental leaves, um, men are increasingly taking more parental leaves compared to before, actually to relieve the family of the burden. I think that's a good thing. So I think a structural change in the working environment is very much necessary. And also the understanding of what a good work needs to be reevaluated. That is, it's not the quantity. It's not that you stay at the hospital, you come at four o'clock and stay till midnight. It's not that. It's really what kind of quality of work do you produce? And I think that's a common theme in evaluating anyone so that the uh, evaluation process becomes relevant to today's uh, individual needs and time frame that individuals have. So I think those are the major things that I, I always think about in my own uh, division here at Columbia. Yeah. It's, it's so true, this uh, key performance index, or the KPI, uh, can really shape um, a, a lot of things. Um, so before joining my current company, I used to be with a US law firm. And the key performance indices were how many hours you work, uh, because we actually, and how many hours you actually bill, billable hours. Um, so the more hours you could bill, um, of course, the better. Uh, and when you have a KPI such as that, uh, it's not necessarily easy for you know either men or women um, who have other commitments uh, at home uh, and things like that. So changing the KPI, I believe, is is so important. Um, I think secondly, uh, one of the things that uh, my company started to do was to really think about the the way one works, uh, being a, a Japanese trading company, Sogo Shosha, uh, it used to be the case that uh, we would come in relatively late by US standards, by 9, 10, but stay very late uh, until midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, even during the week. Um, but uh, we were able to change that uh, structure to a more morning-focused structure so that between the hours of 5 a.m. and 8 a.m., it's considered morning overtime, and you actually get breakfast, and you actually paid more than the evening overtime. Uh, you are basically 
prohibited from working after 8 p.m. And you can leave as early as 3 p.m. Uh, for any reason. And it used to be the case that if you have childcare needs, you could leave early. But uh, that didn't necessarily work very well uh, because those who are leaving early felt kind of bad about leaving early. Those who are left behind felt left behind. Um, but by actually creating a system, an equitable system, that you could actually leave for any reason, because you want to go to the gym, just because you want to go home, uh, but making that equal, uh, that really stayed. And this is something that we didn't foresee, but as a result of that, so we started this in 2010. 13 years later, the birth rate of our female employees dramatically increased from under 1.0 to it's close to 2. Uh, it's not that the, you know, we actually contributed to the overall population growth of Japan. That's not the case. <laughs> but what actually that signifies is that women who were quitting work uh, because of childcare reasons, they were able to stay and continue working with the company. And as a result of that, they were able to uh, balance a work and, and life. And not just only women, men as well. So I think uh, what, you know, coming back to you, Nick, what you said is so important to change the KPI, but also to make things equitable. You know, it's not just uh, necessarily policies only for women or for working parents, um, but to be inclusive. Um, do you have any other thoughts that you want to share with the audience? Fine, no, thank you. Okay, Nick, is there anything that you want to share with the audience before we go to the floor? One thing is that I think I think there's a sense of urgency that's really needed about how women are needed in Japanese working environment. In Japan's aging, there aren't going to be too many Japanese left if they go along the decreasing population. And women are more than 50% of the population. And they are very, very capable, underused resources, and takes Japan's competitive age away. And to, to me, it's like a global warming. It, it's like, it, it's actually coming insidiously to affect all of us. And I think that kind of public sentiment, urgency is really needed to change how we do things. So I, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I know that we have a lot of great leaders in the in this room as well. And uh, maybe you have comments or, or questions. Uh, if we can raise your hand, identify who you are, uh, and uh, present yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Naoko Sugita, and I come from Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. And thank you so much for having me today. I'm very honored. I happen to be a graduate of the first national uh, school that you mentioned, yeah. and also coming from a sector that's doing very poorly from the like science and engineering. Um, this is, I think, this is really my issue, and I cannot agree more to what um, Professor Hebe has said. Um, even if you want to have more female or uh, women employees, I'm if, if you go to the university, there is no that much students uh, majoring in like science and engineering. But I think one thing we um, found out is that um, it's in these areas, it's you have to be able to do good in math. And math, it's it's a subject that you cannot just start like from university, but you have to work through from like elementary school, you cannot just start from like high school. So I think I really agree that um, you have to really um, approach to students even from elementary school that try not to give up on like, um, pursuing um, areas like science and math. So I think the uh, role of the teachers and the parents are really important from the elementary school. Otherwise, you won't have those students in that area. So I definitely agree to what Professor Hibia said. So thank you very much for addressing this. Can I just come back to you and ask you a question? It seems like JAXA has so many great female leaders. Is JAXA doing something uh, to promote more women, to empower women, or is it just by chance? Um, thank you for that. I, I happened to be the director of Gender Equality Office um, about seven years ago. And at that time, we tried very hard to um, address this issue of increasing female researchers. And right now, we have many female at important positions. But unfortunately, I have to say that the ratio of the female managers is still not that high. It's only about 11 percent. So if you consider that there's about like 30% of female workers, there's still a significant gap and we're not doing well in that, but we are trying to put female or women in 
important positions that's really, you know, um, which is very um, op open to many people that it looks like, you know, we're working hard and try to be um, recognizable. So that is one thing. But in, in numerical um, point, we're still not that good in, especially in um, fem the ratio of female in managerial positions. It's only still 11%. Thank you. Ibia Sensei, did you want to come back to what Sugita san said? Well, I really appreciate your comment, Sugita Sensei, because that's coming from you, Nawan, who is really successful in the field of science. So thank you so much for reinforcing my point. Thank you. My name is Takehito from Sofia University. Uh, my question will be uh, for Professor Hibia. Um, Nara Joshidai created engineering department last year. It was an innovative program, and now uh, science and engineering will be focusing on more high school female student. But my question will be about leadership. You have been the former president of ICU. If we want to increase the faculty of female, then next step will be increase the number of president at Japanese university who have been educated as a female president. What are the um, male faculty member can do to create an environment to educate faculty at the department chair, college chair, or president? They will be the prospective um, president of the university in the future. Thank you so much. Be supportive. <laughs> However, be supportive, yes. But again, um, I don't mean you, but so many male faculty members like girls' parents and school teachers also have so much unconscious bias. So each one of you has to be really reflective, you know, look at yourself critically, you know, what kind of message, even from your body language, you express to female students, female faculty members. So that's like the step one. The other thing is, it's not for uh, male faculty members, but some of us are trying to uh, form a group to mentor prospective uh, female vice presidents, uh, president, you know, those who become uh, a higher at the top of the administration. And this is not formal or anything yet, but having a mentor is really important. And in many cases, you really cannot have a mentor within your institution. So we have to uh, form some kind of a group to mentor uh, specifically female vice presidents, presidents, even if they are not from your own institution. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so this is for um, Professor Hibia as well. The, one of the areas you talked about is, you know, starting young, how to get girls more interested in STEM and the unconscious bias, maybe at the elementary level, and there's a lot of female teachers you think could be a problem to that change in mindset. How do you, how do you see change happening there? Um, how, how do you think society needs to start changing that paradigm? Is there anything you're thinking could be done more proactively? You know, uh this is not specifically about, you know, women's education in Japan, but the serious problem right now is so few now would like to go into the field of education. Mm. Elementary, middle, high school teachers, because it's such a hard work. So establishing a work-life balance, like Itochu, probably is a good starting point because unless you have a critical thinker who likes their job into, into the elementary school education or middle school education, I don't think anything will change. The other thing is really parents. So this is totally unrealistic, but we really have to have some kind of parental uh, educational program through which every single mother and father has to go and get the idea that that what you have just said to your child, that really deprives her of many opportunities in the future. It should be done that way, which I don't think is realistic, sorry. Speaking of what parents said, I just wanted to come back to you, Nick, in terms of uh, Stematsu becoming the name Stematsu. You know, you, you are thrown away, but uh, I'm waiting for you. The mother said, 
What was actually meant by that? What, was it a positive message? Was it an encouraging message? <laughs> a very good question. You know, I, I, I think about it. What, what, what does that mean? It's almost, it, it's, to me, it felt so poetic and very Japanese. It's almost like, uh, um, it sounded to me like, almost like I'm losing you, but I'm thinking of you. It's almost, almost like a Japanese suicide. <laughs> that was the felt like to me. And, uh, that's, that feeling of, uh, owner in loss is a way I think mother might have felt. And, uh, I don't know what she felt when she was, her name suddenly changed and she was told, Hey, you're going to get on the ship to go to San Francisco. Probably didn't even know where San Francisco was. And she was only 11 years old. And to the moment was six. So, um, what went on in their minds? It's quite remarkable what they might have been thinking at that time. I don't know if I answered your question, but that was my personal day. In a sense, they were progressive in sending girls over to the United States. Progress, pro I don't know if the progress, progressive or almost, I think the families had something to show for themselves. Maybe they wanted their children to achieve what they couldn't do. They wanted to move Japan forward. They couldn't do it because they were on the losing side, although some of them did have important jobs afterwards. Uh, but I think they had something to prove. And uh, I think that's why they sent children to the U.S. I mean, at that time, I, I think many other parents said, how cruel is it to send someone so young to a place that most of us have never been and to eat food that we've never eaten before, we have something that we never wore before. I mean, as you know, at the age of period, uh, foreigners were seen as barbarians. So it's quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite a uh, um, different thinking. And I'm sure it took a lot of courage on parents' part. You know. Well, we have in the audience somebody who's, uh, in terms of age, closer to the, the, the girls, the five girls. So if I can <laughs> turn to you if you have any questions or comments, having heard that. My name is Matoko Akiyama, and I am a senior high, third year in senior high school right now. Um, so looking out at colleges and my future. Um, and I actually go to the school on the other side of the road, <laughs> um, so Toyo Ewa. Um, and I have two questions today. Um, I'm a prospective political science student. I'm looking, uh, I'm looking to study polit politics um, in university. And uh, my two questions are, what do you think is hindering women from politics? And how will politics change with, uh, how do you think politics will change with more women? Um, and so those are my two questions. And why I'm interested in all of this is because um, I've seen the gender gap index before and why are women going out into different fields, but not into politics? Because you can see the drastic gap between all of the different fields and politics. Um, and last year, I was student president for um, one year. And but looking at other schools and trying to connect with other schools, I realized that in most co-ed schools, the student presidents are always male um, and the secretaries are always girls. Um, and if that was a few schools, then I guess that that would be okay. But I noticed a trend or that that's basically all the schools that I, I looked into. Um, so I wondered if I, I thought that that was similar to what you were saying about education and um, high school, middle school being that building place of unconscious bias. So I think that the unconscious bias in middle school and high school is kind of being um, a reason why women are not really going into politics. But do you think that that is the reason there are more reasons or that there are a few role models? Um, I want to ask that, those questions, please. Thank you so much for your uh, excellent questions. Please, please sit down. 
um, that's why you have to go to a girls' school. <laughs> I myself did uh, go to a girls' school from uh, elementary to high school. I did go to a co ed university, but being educated in women's school in this country still has much value to it. So it is unfortunate that many parents these days look for co-educational schools from the very beginning. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really difficult to change the trend. But you are, in a sense, very fortunate because you already were a, you know, student president and you uh, did show some leadership skills, I'm sure. So that's a good starting point. Now, the reason why there are so few politicians in this country, it's so difficult to run for the office because you must be elected and in order to do so, you have to overcome so many hurdles. Some progressive politicians uh, try to uh, set up a quota or make a special group to encourage women to run for the office, which I think is a very good uh, trend. But before uh, actually becoming a politician, I don't know where you would like to go to your university education, but once you are there, you should really continue your uh, good uh, practice of being a leader of students. So grab any chance to become a leader run for the office at the university level. And I heard from uh, some European countries that student um, government is very powerful. And they actually change the university policies, uh, of course, you know, following the due course. And that is a very good uh, pool for uh, former politicians. So they look to uh, university governments and pick up some prospective, you know, students, promising students, sorry, and try to nurture these students to become actually politicians. So this is again a long way to go, but you really have to, uh, you know, continue your uh, leadership training within university. You have to study political science, the theoretical side, but at the same time, you really have to uh, continue that practice of being a leader. Sometimes it may be a good to be a secretary because you have to see everything from like 360 degrees. So you don't have to be leaders all the time, but at least try to be a leader, um, maybe 50% of the time when you have a chance. But I really look forward to your future. You might be the first female president, uh, the prime minister of the country. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Just as a comment, I, I totally agree with those comments. And, and, and in Japan, there are only two, two governors, women governors, out of 47 uh, areas, only in Tokyo and uh, Yamagata. And in, in, uh, as was mentioned, actually, in political gender equity in uh, Japan is behind Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. It is, it's quite remarkable if you think about those statistics. But I think mentors are very important, that predecessors are important, that men tend to select men, and the thinking is quite different. So for aspiring women leaders, I think well, if I can, I can find some kind of an affinity group working with women leaders, get to know them, where are they? How can they work together with the younger generation? I think formation of such groups and learning from the predecessors and teachers, mentors, I think that's critically important as well. We have one question uh, from Izumi-san in the U.S. And um, she is living and working in the U.S. after graduating from ICU. And she is a full-time working mother and a graduate student, which she believes that it could have been a very challenging path it was, uh, if it was in Japan. So this is a question to both uh, Professor uh, Hibia and uh, Dr. Homa. Um, how do you evaluate Japan's effort for the systemic change to improve the current situation, such as giving longer 
a parental leave for both women and especially for men so that both parents can give equal roles, ro roles in uh, child care and housekeeping. Okay, okay. I, I think that's a good start, but I, I think there are fundamental problems such, such as, uh, um, as many of you know, at a G7 meeting, the representative for gender equity issue was a man, not, not a woman. And he might understand issues, but it doesn't represent a very good way to show Japan's efforts. And that's very important to change. And fundamentally, uh, I, I don't think Japan has done enough to make the population understand why gender equity is important, why it's important for the individuals. That means for the uh, nationals as well as for the country. That it's a real issue that's facing not uh, just about women, but it's about you, but it's about the future of the country. And that's, I think, many leaders, particularly business leaders and those in medicine, of course, need to understand that it affects what you do, that having women increases the efficiency, thinking, and performance of what you do. It's really for you that we need to do this. So I think the basic understanding somehow has to be changed. And if it doesn't, that doesn't work, uh, as was Japan is trying to do, perhaps make it an affirmative action. A uh, certain number of people have to be women and so forth, as Japan's trying to do, that's maybe necessary as well. But I think it needs to do a lot more. That's my simple conclusion here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with uh, Dr. Homa as well. Uh, of course, you know, what's going on right now is good, but we really need to do much, much more. Also, the uh, setting up the target is important, but many times, once the target is set up, people really try to accomplish the target, tending to forget why it's necessary. So it is always important why we are doing this, why is it important to increase the female workforce, and so on and so forth. So always uh, ask that question to yourself, to the society, to people around you, discuss. Otherwise, once you s accomplish the target, oh, we did well, and then it stops there. Thank you. I know that we're coming to uh, close, so why don't we do this? Why don't we take all of the questions before getting to the answer? So maybe if you can start with you. Hi, my name is Aaron Mullen, uh, CEO of Ichijiku. Um, so I have a more general question about kind of Japan society and how it relates to, I guess, women's empowerment. But it seems that everywhere you turn, be it in a conveni with magazines kind of objectifying women with the myriad ways that men can objectify women from the snack to club to maid cafes, it's prevalent on TV. Women are objectified. They're treated like they need to be saved. Edu I agree with everything you said, but when you have all this kind of objectification institutionalized, is it all for naught? Does it sometimes feel like, what's the point if when you step outside, everything you've been taught seems to not make any sense because everywhere you go, you're seen as like an object of men. And do we need to basically tear down these institutions in order for everything you're talking about to be effective? Hi, um, my name is Emma Ryan Yamazaki, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. I actually, my latest film, I spent last school year in a Japanese public elementary school for 150 days, and that film is hopefully will um, come out soon. But I also do a lot of work with NHK, and there's been mention of kind of more need for more representation in society, and I think it kind of echoes what you say. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, even at NHK, which is like the public broadcaster. Um, the the subjects of documentaries on television, so many more men are picked than women. Um, at the surface level, kind of like with elementary schools, like there are a lot of women, <laughs> but then as they got higher up, I would say the top 25 most important people at NHK are all men. So I'm wondering, you know, what can we in the media or, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm part of the media, but what can the media do, do you think, to kind of keep, to contribute to the issues that have been raised today? I think I'm going to change my comment into a question about PTAs in Japan. <laughs> so 
It's quite famous that、uh, the head of PTAs at the highest levels are all men in Japan. So, my question is shouldn't we be focusing on the PTAs? Because that's where you get the teachers and the parents at the elementary school level. Until you have higher level、uh, women showing up in leadership positions in PTA,、uh, how are we going to move from youth to、uh, the diet? Thank you. So, great questions. Thank you so much. We don't have time to answer all of those, but why don't I do this?、Um, if I could start with maybe Ia s e n s e i you, your closing remark,、um, maybe like one minute, and maybe incorporating some,、um, but whatever you want to say, and then we can turn to Nick for the same. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with you. We have to change the society, period. But for example, for places like NHK,、uh, I know that you cannot change the whole thing. But for example, when, whenever the organization、uh, is planning to have a documentary for, let's say, for an hour about someone, then at least 30% of those who are focused should be women. I think, I don't know how these documentary、uh, programs were made, but you get together and discuss who to focus and so on and so forth. Does somebody raise an issue like, hey, we do, do need to have more women being、uh, the focus of documentary films? So that kind of thinking probably, maybe incrementally, but change the atmosphere of the、uh, broadcasting company and also society as a whole, which takes too long, so we have to take other measures as well. I think in order to change things, I think forums such as this, our discussion, it's very important. There needs to be more of this. There needs to be more pressure on the government. And Japan is pretty weak from pressure from the outside of Japan. So, I think we need to try to get that going. Asia society is a good example. Japan society, other places, other organizations push politicians to change. And the last thing I think about is what would Umeko and Stemo say when they were sitting in the audience? And I would say, they would say, I got education to almost the way it is. Now it's your turn to bring all the energy forward. So, they took 30 years to get our school going. I think it's something we got to keep doing and get this changed. Thank you so much.、Um, so, this year is the Year of Japan、uh, by the Asia Society. And the theme for the Year of Japan is ambitious reimagination. Ambitious reimagination. And so, through programs such as this,、uh, we want to really push Japan forward. Uh, there are a lot of、uh, great ideas that came from this panel and from the audience as well. So I thank you very much for coming and stay tuned for future programs. Thank you very much.